Na na na. Awkward silence. Well, welcome everybody to live in the BCYD Elephant Room for a great conversation today. I'm Ben Johnson, our Next Generation Ministries Director, here with the BC and Yukon District Office, and we've got Dave Solms here, our Assistant Superintendent, and uh, we're just excited today to talk about a fresh look at our BC and Yukon District, how we can reach out in, a, in some fresh ways. It's no doubt that the face of Canada has changed. Uh, you know, you read uh, local newspapers, even uh, walk out your front door and look the left and the right. Um, there is uh, multicultural realities. There is multi-religious realities. Language, so many people in Canada and in British Columbia don't speak English as their first language at home. Uh, and uh, what a great opportunity for us to appreciate uh, the diversity within British Columbia and Yukon. Uh, a, a group of churches that we number close to 190 right now serving across a province that is really very, very diverse from large cities to villages to towns. Uh, we want to know who we live amongst. And so our uh, interest today, uh, Ben and I's interest today is for us to have a fresh appreciation for the diversity of people that live within our district. And so we're really glad that you're here. Great. We have a just a great panel of guests with us today, and uh, we have Jazz Gag, and we have Fassel Malik, and we have uh, Jeff Wong. And so, guys, why don't you just introduce our, yourselves to everybody just uh, quickly before we just dive into some good discussion. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks, Dave. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah, so really quick, just a quick background. Uh, you know, I, I uh, grew up as a Sikh. I was uh, born and raised in Merritt, B.C., small town, Merritt. Uh, lots of Indian population there, lots of uh, Caucasian population, and lots of Aboriginal population. We used to kind of jokingly say it was uh, being raised with uh, cowboys and Indians and Indians because it was just a, just a real interesting dynamic growing up in small town interior BC. But uh, grew, growing up as a Sikh, uh, going to temple every weekend with my parents and trying to understand all of that dynamic and understanding that you know there has to be more than this. You know, trying to understand the language, trying to understand what was going on every every. Uh, Saturday we were there, and Sundays we were there, just trying to take it in and understand what is this religion about, what is this faith about, and just having that real lacking there, and not understanding, you know, just really thinking that, that, that there has to be more than this. Mm. And, you know, and then coming to experience Jesus through a youth group, a youth ministry in the Pentecostal Church in Merritt, and, uh, and just having this supernatural experience of discovering Jesus is so much more greater than anything that I had served or, or, or really tried to understand before. And my life was completely transformed at that point. And that was like 15 and a half years old. So, you know, just amazing transformation and, and a slow change, you know, towards being more like him and uh, continue to do that. So hmm. That's an awesome story, isn't it? I yeah. really appreciate yeah. you Fantastic. sharing that. Amazing. Um, you know, my story is a little d different than him. Jazz here, I was born in Pakistan, and, uh, raised as a devout Sunni Muslim. And I remember, you know, after school, like the same intention of our family and our parents was that, you know, we'd be devout. And so I remember after school going to this special place and studying the Quran for like three or four hours. We were taught in a small little place and there'd be like 30 of us students there. Mm. And this happened every day, like in school hours, right after school, we'd go there and do that. And, and the goal was, you know, to be a devout Muslim. And uh, being raised as a Muslim, you don't think that your faith is different than your culture, your life. Your faith is your life. Everything you do should stem out of what you believe. And that's kind of how I grew up. And then I remember, you know, moving to Canada over here and uh, I got involved in business, got involved with some, in some of the different cultural differences. Uh, some people would argue and debate with me. And I, I guess I was more of the argument of debating guy. They were more nicer to me, I think. But I would say to them, you know, the Bible is inaccurate. It's been changed. You guys are in deception as Christians. Uh, you're believing Jesus is the Son of God. And for a Muslim, that stuff is all, uh, w w that's really serious. We take that as the greatest sin you could commit is to, is to worship Jesus as the Son of God. And so in the midst of all that, I, I, I was invited to a church, but I never really went to a church. But then I got invited to a business convention, and that's where I had an encounter with God. It was July 3rd, 94, and in this encounter, I heard an audible voice. God spoke to me, and when he spoke to me and said, these Christians are my children, because I had said to him, God, what are you doing here uh, amongst Christians, in other words, that are worshiping and blaspheming you? So I thought, and he said, no, these are my children. And he said it three times. And when he said that, instantly I knew that Jesus is the Son of God. I remember walking forward and confessing him as Lord. And that's really when my life changed and a, a tremendous transformation like, like Jazz mentioned began to, to start. Very good. For me, um, I'm Chinese. I was uh, 
born in Vancouver. Uh, my parents are Chinese from Malaysia and from Singapore. And um, I, when I was born, I grew up in Ladner. I was one of very few like, Chinese in my, I remember in our school pictures, um, there's, there's only one yellow face, <laughs> which was me. I moved to Burnaby. At that time, there weren't very many Asians in Burnaby. And, um, and once again, just one of very few growing up in school. I, um, my parents were Christians. They weren't going to church. And, and uh, my uncle and aunt brought me to an evangelical uh, Bible church. And uh, from there, we, we accepted Christ. We also brought our parents back to church. And, um, and so I've grown up in Vancouver my whole life, born and raised here. I've seen the, the transition from, from hardly any Asians to a lot of Asians, and then more South Asians and Filipinos as well. And um, then currently I'm pastoring at a church called More Than Twelfth, and which is in the Vancouver, um, in the Commercial Drive neighborhood of Vancouver. And our church is very eclectic, a wide variety of, of races and cultures and subcultures as well. Great to be a part of uh, this conversation today. I know that there's many people that have logged into this from across Canada. There is an opportunity um, on your screen to engage in a conversation through a live chat window. Uh, we also have a moderator that's a part of this. And uh, if you have specific questions for any one of our, our panelists or even input uh, that you would like uh, to be expressed during this bit of time, please uh, um, mark that on your chat window as a question and uh, possibly there might be a chance for us to specifically address some of your questions and uh, address some of your comments. So this is fantastic. So Jazz, as you were uh, just making reference to merit, uh, cow would you say Cowboys, Indians and Indians? Yeah, cowboys, <laughs> Indians and Indians, cows, yes. Yeah. There you go, hey. Yeah. Um, I, I would imagine that there was times when there was a, um, I don't know if the best word is collision, but there is probably mm -hmm. a great contrast between your Sikh context and your family of origin living in merit yeah. in a, um, amongst people that probably didn't understand you, um, probably created some judgments possibly, and maybe there was judgments on your part towards mm -hmm. the Canadian culture as well. Can you kind of unpack that for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it was amazing growing up in this small town because it, it's a very much a small town. It's in a valley. If any of you have been to Merritt, yeah, you know. Yeah, Nicola Valley. In Nicola yeah, Valley. Yeah. You kind of go there. Most people gas up and continue on their way. But growing up in this this valley of Merritt, uh, you know, with these different very clear uh, kind of people groups, if you want to call it that, there, there were. There were a lot of uh, uh, clashes. There was a lot of tensions, and uh, you know, still exist to, to this day. But growing up in that environment, you know, really as a Sikh and 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 from my family of origin, and living actually right next door to some Aboriginal folks, and and just that alone, just uh, from one side of the fence to the other side of the fence, dealing with all kinds of culture clashes. You know, that that you know sometimes came out in some really ugly ways. Um, that I've had to later had to repent for, you know, some of the attitudes and the behaviors that I exhibited personally. But, uh, and then, and coming back my way as well. You know, a lot of misunderstanding, uh, miscommunication, not, not uh, having any cultural sensitivity whatsoever between all those different groups together. It, it made for a really interesting environment and, you know, an environment where someone could get really hardened, uh, you know, towards people of different backgrounds or different yeah. cultures. What, what are, so you're, you're mentioning some of these realities. Do, do, is it, it's more than language? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it behavior? Or is it judgments? Is yeah. it uh, value? Is it hierarchy? It's, uh, it, there's, there's a combination of all those things. Yeah. Definitely hierarchy, uh, you know, they have this and, and these people have that. And, and, and then uh, values, you know, what, what my family values and what my, my people, you know, Indian people, Indo-Canadian people value would be perhaps very different than what Aboriginal people value or what, you know, the Canadian culture, quote unquote, Caucasian people, as we would see it, would value. So very different values and those values really clashing, you know, even in, in simple things like uh, um, um, finances, you know, uh, Indian people are very focused on, on saving and wanting to, to, you know, really prepare, um, do the best that they can for the next generation. And so, you know, I remember my father saying, hey, you know, everything I'm doing here in Canada, and he, and he came to Canada uh, from India with five dollars, literally five dollars wow, no in his pocket. Has worked incredibly hard, and you know I've learned so much from him. Incredibly hard, but he said to me, you know, everything I'm doing, it's not for me, it's for you. It's for you guys as you grow as the kids, as a family, 
for, for the next generation. And so that's a very much a very, a very focused goal, yeah. right? And that clashes. Yeah, you know, and, and, and Canadians waste a lot. You know, and, yeah. and so you're, you're, uh, there's, there's a judgment on your part sure. in some ways in terms of behavior. Right, exactly. And then the differences between that culture, growing up in that value system, and then being born and raised here in Canada right. uh, in, the, in this culture, in the westernized culture, uh, which is very different, trying to kind of have both feet in those worlds yeah. caused all kinds of tension and all kinds of difficulty. And so, you know, really, again, bringing it back to Jesus, coming into faith in Christ in my mid-teens, there was this solid rock foundation where I could actually put both my feet and say, hey, you know, in Jesus, I have the ability to be able to bridge here. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, um, so Fassel, let me ask you a question. Um, you know, Jazz's story, there are some similarities. There's obviously some differences. But what would you say would be some great ways to just begin to, to make that, you know, to build that bridge, to begin to, uh, you know, just reach out, kind of uh, understanding your culture and crossing into another culture and vice versa? Sure. Uh, great great uh, question, Ben. I think one thing I've noticed, and I think we all would agree, that regardless of our culture, there's some basic things that we all need as the family of humanity. And I found that if we have an, a culture of love, no human is going to uh, not appreciate love and a culture of not judging. I found that when I came to Christ, uh, many people came to know the Lord, like approximately 1,500 people in the first three years without being a minister, without being a pastor, just being a business person in everyday life. And what I observed was three things. Number one, I loved them unconditionally, and I wasn't trying to love them with a motive to try to necessarily get them saved. I wanted them to know Jesus, but I would love them anyway even if they didn't. And number two, never judge them. So they feel free to talk about uh, their situation or, or the sin or whatever they're going through, which they don't even identify as sin really. Never judge them. And, and th that was the second thing. And the third thing was you'd be willing to listen. And it's something so simple that we can all do regardless of our cultural background. These are things you can talk to any human being if you genuinely do that. And, and I add one more thing was I always honored them. Especially men, when you give honor to a man, it truly opens their heart to receive. So when you genuinely honor somebody with a sincere heart, and you know you honor them enough to say, "I'm going to listen to you," you know I'm interested in. I'm not going to judge you because I didn't die for you. Yeah. Jesus did, and I'm going to love you unconditionally. These are the basic foundations I think of building any bridge across any culture. And I also found sometimes we may not know certain things about the Sikh culture or the Muslim culture or the Chinese culture or any other culture, but if you do it with the right heart, they can tell. Yeah. And they're very uh, open. Like I find a lot of Muslims, for example, in our case, we do a lot of ministry amongst Muslims. They're very open. People ask me all the time, what can I do to relate to a Muslim? Don't be afraid. Uh, if you want to invite them over for dinner, be hospitable. They love hospitality. That's some of the culture. Let's love them. Let's honor them. And even if you do something that they think is not necessarily culturally right to them, uh, but you did it with the right heart of love and honor, they'll have no problem understanding your heart. Wow. And people are sensitive to our hearts. So I think that would probably be my, my number one thing right there is let's have an open heart and, and let that heart of God reach out. And I believe everyone has uh, the Spirit of God in them. So that heart is in us, and He knows how to relate to somebody. Love honor and not being afraid of them and listening to them. Yeah. Those are great things. Yeah, and Jazz, you kind of mentioned in your testimony too, it was a youth, youth ministry that you got connected to. Um, talk about that. Was there love? Was there yeah. honor? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, I, I, I was invited to come out to this youth night, and I really had no idea what it was. It was in a gymnasium at the school that I was at, uh, just like a gym night, a youth night, sports night. And uh, I remember going out to that and you know, even as a kid who really wanted to fit in, who wanted to have relationships, and you know, like most teens do, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was hesitant. I was really cautious. I was actually very suspicious because I thought, boy, you know, these Christians, I think they just want to convert me. I think that's, that's, they're just, that's their kind of thing. <laughs> and, they, and they do. And, and, uh, but, 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 you know, so, so I went very specifically with, with the mindset yeah. that if I go in there and anyone tries to shove a Bible down my throat, I'm walking out. And, and, cause that's kind of what I'm expecting. So shoving Bibles is not a be yeah. best practice. No, not probably. a best practice. Not generally. No. <laughs> Let's avoid that one. And so going Check. there and, and, and yeah. engaging with those, those youth yeah. and realizing and seeing there was really a genuine care for mm -hmm. one another and seeing that they weren't calling each other down. They weren't, you know, this behavior, it was behavior. And yeah. there's, you know, understanding that there was something going on there that made me very curious. And, you know, looking back at it, I understand it was the Spirit of God drawing so, me. So love showed up in your story. Yeah. Love showed up yeah. in your story. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. And Jeff, uh, love show up in your story? Yes and no. Yeah. You know, here okay. and there. Um, yeah. 
I remember in, uh, in, in Bible College, actually, here in Langley, on the Northwest Campus, uh, uh, the Northwest Baptist uh, Campus on uh, Trinity Western, uh, I remember one of my friends who's Caucasian said to me, Jeff, when I see you, I don't see Chinese, I just see Jeff. And she meant well. But for me, I was, I was thinking, what? You don't wow. see the Chinese part of me? <laughs> and, um, and yet there's a, there's a tension in me. I, didn't, I, I, I struggled with, am I Chinese or am I Canadian? And I wrestled with that for, for quite a while. And um, you know, I, I noticed that, that it, takes, it, it takes asking questions. It takes um, trying to understand each other. It takes some room to be able to wrestle with some of these things. You know? So when we build bridges, like things like language are important. I, I I noticed Dave when you were interacting with Jazz earlier. You you you, um, you mentioned, but the Canadians are this way. And to me, in my mind, I just, I just like something snapped. I was like, Canadians are this way. But I, this is a Canadian over here, you oh, know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't even catch that. Yeah. so to me, Canadians look like they look varied and diverse. And so I grew up with a lot of that, uh -huh. but yet. You know, when I was serving in, in Point Grey Community Church in Kitsilano, our whole staff almost was not born in Vancouver. I'm the only one. Like, I am a native Vancouverite yeah. Canadian, and, um, and I'm, but I'm yellow. And um, there's just languages and, you know, these, these, types of, these types of differences. I also noticed there's a lot of, um, me growing up, I had a similar experience to jazz. There's was a lot of, I don't know. Confusion, cultural. One of my colleagues called it cultural confusion. Mm -hmm. um, you grow up watching the Brady Bunch, and a family looks like that. And then when I'm at home, my family does not look like that. Totally. And um, then you watch the Cosby Show, and they're v verbally expressive. And in Chinese culture, you're not physically or verbally affectionate. And so you start to wonder: Do your parents love you? Because that's not what they don't act like the mm -hmm. parents in the Cosby Show. And um, and there's you know these types of these types of tensions. But I find what can be really helpful is that you want, you generally want to learn about someone's culture, mm -hmm. and then you take that and you remember. It. You ask questions, but you have to listen because listening is a is a part of love. And then and you remember, and then you you inter you interact with them through their culture. When I like I live in in Surrey right now in in a Punjabi neighborhood, and so when I pass by a Sikh man w with a turban who doesn't expect to talk with me, sometimes I might greet him and say, Sasri Akal. And then they're, sh they're shocked and they smile. And, um, and then we can, we can interact, you know, and it's, they become open. Mm -hmm. Or I go and I'm, I'm in a sweet shop ordering samosas. Everyone's looking at me, why is a, s a <laughs> Chinese guy ordering samosas? And, and, and I talk about how I love Indian food, which I do. You know. That's the beautiful thing about our, our culture in Vancouver in particular, but I think it express, expresses itself in other parts of British Columbia and as our province continues to change, different communities are, are experiencing that multicultural blend. And I was reading an article in a magazine about uh, the food in Vancouver and it's called Fusion food you know it's a bit of Indian it's a bit of uh, you know Chinese it's a bit of a bit of sushi thrown in there and you kind of mix it all together a bit of uh, you know North American kind of traditional food and it's their fusion food I wonder if we can be uh, you know learn something from that as the church that, that we can communicate that our language can be uh, more of a fusion kind of language as we're expressing our love as we're aware more of uh, so how would we maybe just start to go about that do you think like how can we reach out how can we understand language how can we learn more about other cultures have you guys had some experience in, in some of that can i comment on that sure. a little bit at our church we've, we've 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 tried to do that we've tried to take like some sometimes we have some some indian tabla um like samples in the in the music of our, our worship sometimes we put in some traditional chinese instrument samples like in, in our church our music is quite uh progressive there's we use electronic elements and stuff like that so we have the luxury to be able to sample some of those things when i was at a previous church i invite and i was a worship pastor i invited a chinese woman to play the chinese zither it's a long instrument like with strings it sounds like a harp almost and we mix that with modern instruments of electric guitars and drums and a dj you know and um and so we mix these cultural elements i also noticed that all our worship teams are only caucasian uh the people are only caucasian so 
I'd bring in an African hand drummer because there's Africans in our congregation. And I, I'd bring in an Asian, you know, person to, to play another role. Then from the front, you see the, the faces of leadership were varied. And then right away, we, there's, um, we started to notice changes in the congregation. People would see, there's someone like me who's on the worship team. There's someone like me doing announcements. There's someone like me preaching. And that made a huge difference. Hey, Jazz, when we were um, talking about this before uh, our, our, our webinar, you were talking about the need as a Christian pastor or leader to coach your congregation right. in terms of studying and appreciating uh, people that are different than themselves. What, what did you yeah. mean by that? What are some coaching, and, and if any of you have a comment on that, what are things that we as Christian leaders need to coach our congregations about? Sure. Well, I, I think absolutely our congregations and we as leaders need to be stretched in the area of really learning about other people, really actually taking a very serious uh, look at who is around us in the communities that we're serving and understanding what they believe. What What is the belief of people in our community? Um, you know, really trying to take away... Uh, and then, and then communicating that to our mm -hmm. congregations, you know, our congregations can learn. Hey, here's here's what people believe of this background of, of mm -hmm. people that are in our community. Just so you have a good understanding, a good knowledge of that, so that if you are going to have a conversation, if you are going to start a conversation, you're not starting that conversation from some point of ignorance or or, or, or misunderstanding. You're, you're you're starting that conversation from a place of knowledge uh, that's healthy. And I really think the other part of it is just really working on the us-them mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we've been very much about, in our Canadian church, about being homogeneous. You know, it's, it's just, you know, our people and, 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 you know, well, let's plant churches for those people. I really don't think that's the way of the future. I think we need to be looking at uh, integration versus assimilation. There's two very different things that are going on between integrating and assimilating. Mm -hmm. You know, we have assimilation pastors. I, I think that's scary. Because, you know, assimilating was really like just making it just like me. Mm -hmm. uh, integrating is saying, how do I take what you value and what you mm -hmm. believe and what, what your faith is about with your mm -hmm. culture and integrate that into the life of the church, like what you're doing, Jeff, you know, similarly in, in worship. So there's a question here. Uh, maybe, Fauzi, you could sure. answer it. Is it better as a church? And it kind of bridges off of what um, Jazz is saying. Is it, is it better as a church to be a cultural melting pot or better to be a cultural mosaic? Cultural melting pot <laughs> or cultural mosaic. Good luck we, on that we one. War, we warned you it's going to be. Deep. Yeah. Can we be both at the same time? I don't time? even know what well, the yeah, question well, means. Yeah. Like, well, I think I do, do but. Do we a, have an interpreter? A cultural yeah. melting pot. I think are, we, are we trying to reach one kind of people right. or are we trying yeah. to be. Or is it international? Uh, strat strategy like Jeff. Jeff I has a strategy to be. For me, my yeah. perspective, and I think all. it may vary. I like the melting pot uh, for different cultures coming in together because we are a multicultural nation. We are now becoming a global community. People that are growing up today with social media, Twitter, Facebook, all this stuff, people's friends are global. So I think as a church, we got to make two steps. we got to have all cultures welcome because Jesus relates to all cultures. God loves. He created mm -hmm. them. They're unique. We, we tell people all the time in our church, you know, uh, man will tolerate you, but God will celebrate your differences. So we want those Chinese differences. We want those cultural differences. And we want to identify and recognize the God factor in them. Mm. That's what we learn from. That's where we connect because you know God made people like that. Like He, this is how God made him. This is how God made him. That's how God made me. Mm -hmm. That's how God made you. So you know what? There's some basic foundational things that we all are a unique expression of the Father in Christ. Mm -hmm. And if we treat people like that from the offset and we welcome them, I love the fact we are multi, completely multicultural church, multi faith based stream, like regardless of their background and all that. We love it. That's who Jesus is. It keeps us from being too yeah. religious, too boxed in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can relate to one another, serve one another honor one another so I believe you know I would probably take that approach and also thinking I think we should go even beyond just moving from one culture to multiculture we need to start thinking global community like like uh, Jazz yeah. said that you know what how do we learn from one another how do we learn from the Chinese how do we learn from the Japanese uh, the Korean uh, they're all very different actually we, it's not good to put them all in the same box and yeah. often we do that in Canada we can't do that we have to recognize their, their differences but appreciate and find the unique God factor in any individual we meet and if we do that as a church and we honor them they will start to realize there's something different about mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of my perspective. Mm -hmm. There's another question that's been uh, submitted too. Can, can, um, do you reach people, un, um, is it best to uh, reach unreached people first from their context or from ours? Like are we, are we and is, it, is it about integrating yourself incarnationally into another culture and reaching and helping from there? Or is it, um, 
Help me with the question, man. Well, I think our di- I think <laughs> it's our, a statement. I guess no, our, our dialogue is a lot about yeah. our perspective of how are we reaching yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, so let's turn that a bit. Let's let's yeah. talk about how how what are people thinking about the church? Like what about what are Muslims right. thinking? What are Sikhs thinking? Yeah. What are the toxic what, behaviors? What are right. yeah. young people, uh, young adults, you know, multicultural Asians, Africans thinking in Vancouver about uh-huh. the church? Yeah. Well, if you want, I can comment on the Muslim side. Yeah. They're thinking about how we can, you know, buy the church and turn it into a mosque. Mm. So it's a little bit of a different perspective, yeah. and I and I and I say that, but it's true because in Europe and England, that's you know if, if we look at them as an example, a lot of churches are shutting down and mosques are being put in their place. So buying properties is a is it's a major a, strategy. Yeah, it's a major strategy for them, and also we need to understand that, uh, especially with the Muslims, it might be a little different, but similar, I think, to a lot of cultures, uh, they also have a very strong uh, faith mindset. Uh, they believe themselves to be, you know, of course, they're children of Ishmael. Ishmael is in the Bible, of course, and they're descendants of Ishmael. And so they, they look at this whole thing very differently. They approach it in a perspective where they feel they're right. They're supposed to believe in the other three books. So kind of connected to both your question, we try to relate to them by finding bridges in the Quran and finding bridges in what they believe. So we kind of look at their context. Mm-hmm. For example, the Quran says Jesus is the word of God. So that's a good bridge for us. Yeah. Well, you believe yeah. Jesus is the word of God. The Quran says he's born of a virgin, that he's coming back. So we got three solid foundational bridges. And you can't really talk to a Muslim too long without them bringing up what they believe or challenge what you and I believe. So I think that, number one, uh, let's not be afraid to have these type of conversations. Not, let's not be afraid to ask them how they view us. I think we should just yeah. ask them, Ben. We should say, hey, yeah. as a Muslim, how do you view me as a Christian? How That's do you view our question, church? Yeah. And they, they'd be glad to tell you. Yeah. We'll probably learn more from them right there mm-hmm. and, and then and say, well, this is how we view you. You guys seem to be like yeah. this. And well, they're like, no, we're not. I don't have a gun on me today, so I'm not a terrorist, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, and, and that's the thing. Not all Muslims are terrorists, even though media's sure. painted that picture sometimes and we think, you know, we see a Muslim cross the street. But that's not the case. They're right. people. We got to love them. We got to honor them. So, I think what we're doing here, could you imagine having this type of dialogue with Muslims, with Sikhs, uh, with Chinese people, uh, or unbelievers, and seeing them together in a panel and saying, hey, just, let's just have honest conversation. Mm. Let's agree here that you know, we live in the same world, uh, you know, no, no one's uh, better than the other here, but what can we learn from one another, and, and how, how do you come to that place of belief? What makes you want to believe in our God, or what makes you think there is no God? And I think those kind of conversations, especially with Muslims, they love having them. You know, I think you kind of said something. You said our incarnational living, and I, I really think that's key. Uh, I remember being at, in Bible college and, uh, you know, uh, being criticized by someone who is from a similar background as mine, uh, strongly criticized for going to the temple for a family event. And so, you know, they said, how can you go there? Uh, you know, that's you know, a place where... The enemy's at work, and, and you can't, you know, be going into that place. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, if I don't go, hmm. prayerfully go, and be amongst my family, what right do I have to share anything? Yeah. Uh, you know, incarnational living, hmm. knowing and trusting that God is in your life, God is working through in and through you. If you need to engage, you need to be there, you need to live as part of and be, be engaged in. Now, you know, in that, I'll say really quickly, you know, I've made some decisions that, you know, for, for really, actually, as, as my wife and I, Leslie and I have talked, for our children's sake, we've had to process through things as we've been married and, and living and trying to live incarnationally. We won't bow. We, we just feel that we just can't do that. We won't bow. Uh, you know, when there's different times of the service where you do that, we just, we choose to just stay standing. And, you know, if anyone would ever have a question, we would, we would share that with them because it's just, we can't, you know, because of our faith. And in all, in all the years that we've been, been there, been part of it, only one person has ever asked, and it was my grandfather. And so we had a really interesting conversation after that. But incarnational living and then also trusting that the Holy Spirit's at work. So yeah. you need to yeah. engage. You need to be at work. Trust that God's in that, in that inter- in interaction, in that uh, intentionality. So t- practically, if I wanted to meet a Sikh, where would I go? I'd go to the temple. Go to the temple. Just go to show the up. temple, show up, and say, hey... Um, can you tell me about your faith? Uh, I'm just curious. You know what? The temple's an open place. People don't understand that, you know, Sikhs, for example, they believe that all different faiths are fine. You know, if you want to be a Christian, that's great. And if you want to, you know, there's not this kind of, boy, you know, they don't go out and try to, you know, convert people to Sikhism. That's not part of the culture or the religion. Uh, the religion actually believes their first prayer is Ekon God. There is one God. They believe in one God. Commonly, what happens in our churches sometimes is people get confused between Muslims yeah. and Sikhs and Hindus and all this stuff. Well, they believe in all kinds of gods. Oh, they're you know terrorists or you know what are they packing around? You know, and what's underneath the turban? All those. What does that colors mean? I and mean, all these different yeah. things. It's just a lack of understanding sure. and really uh, saying instead of going, you know, those people, those people, 
are not like us mm. as a dominant culture, really, which there is no real dominant culture. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a mix. Yeah. Instead of saying, hey, God, how, how do I understand yeah. the people that are in my community? It's, it really has yeah. so much to do with learning. Hey, Jez, you mentioned going to the temple. Like, I imagine that's easier for, for you. When, when I think of going to the Sikh temple, like there's one right on Scott Road that's just down the street from where I live. That's a huge step for a Chinese or Canadian to go into a Sikh temple. I wouldn't even know what to do. I wouldn't know what direction to go. Do I take off my shoes? Do I have to wear something on my head? Can I eat this or not eat this? Do I get a chair? Do I sit on the floor? And like, mm -hmm. what are some, like, is there anything more specific you can tell <laughs> well, us? That is intimidating. You know, it is intimidating, but I think if you go and you genuinely want to learn, mm -hmm. you walk in and you look for someone who looks like they kind of know what's going on there. Most people would, because culture and religion are intertwined in, in Sikhism. You don't become a Sikh per se, you are from birth. So there is an understanding of, of what the norms are right off the bat. So going in and being open and asking, saying, hey, you know, I've never been here. I'm curious about, you know, what you believe and what, you, you know, your faith. And can you help me with the steps that I need to take to even come into the place, into the building? You know, so it's, mm -hmm. I think it's just ask. And, and even if, let's say, you're in this place, maybe you can't go there. There are Sikhs everywhere, especially in BC. Right, yeah. I mean, this is a major populace of, of Sikhs, and they're in business. They're, you're going to run across them in our everyday world. So, hey, do you mind if I grab a coffee with you? You know, the Sikh guy you met at the paint store or, you know, the, the business owner there. First of all, as a business person, he's very interested in connecting with this community. Grab a coffee and say, you know, I've, I've always been interested in understanding your culture. I think that's maybe a little yeah. easier, right? Maybe if, if you don't feel sure. like, you know, doing yeah. what Jazz is suggesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or go to a restaurant. Yeah. 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 And Christians yeah, are restaurant. good at that. They're e good at going good to food. restaurants. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we're talking to church leaders today, primarily. As they lead churches in the midst of diversity, um, you know, we, we use maybe the word toxic behaviors. Do you, do you think that there are toxic behaviors within our churches that create hindrances to relationship and conversation? I think there are. There's, uh, if you have a superior attitude in any way, culturally, religiously, that is such a turnoff for anyone. If they're young, if they're a young person, if they're, if they're a, f uh, a new immigrant, if, um, if they're a Canadian of a different ethnic descent, if you, if they, th if it's, if you have the like us and them mentality. I remember. Uh, listening to even a Chi a, like a Chinese Canadian f uh, female pastor uh, talking about um, you know when these people come to our churches we got to be like this these people and stuff like in a good way she used to think about ministry and love and stuff like that but if my pe if if the, like at our, at our church we have a variety of those types of people if they were with us in that conversation they would feel very marginalized and and and, and looked down upon and and very targeted. You know, so it's, it's, that's, that's difficult. That's, that's toxic behavior. That's a part of toxic behavior. It, it needs to be a we conversation, yeah. not, not a us, them conversation or, or those people conversation. It's so important that we say we, what are we about? How are we going to do this? And, you know, when you look at toxic behaviors, I think, you know, one of them, you know, that, that's definitely one of them. Another one I think is, is really, uh, um, you know, the suspicion you know, I mean, I can I can uh, share really quick, really really quickly. Being in a church in, in a, another community outside of Merritt and walking in uh, for a Sunday morning service at a church I'd never been to, and uh, uh, needing to use the washroom as I walked in, wanting to go to the washroom, and and kind of being followed in by an usher and thinking, okay, this is odd, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> Hate and, it when that happens. Yeah, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> and then coming out of that washroom, and the usher saying, can I help you? <laughs> you know, very question that I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just here for church. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, you are. Oh, oh, oh shocked really? and no surprised. Kidding. And I thought, no kidding. Wow, like I could just Yikes. walk out of here and say, yeah, really, really jerks, yeah. you know, like. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we're talking about uh, behaviors, culture. Every church has a culture. Even every local church yeah. kind of ha has its own culture. Some of those things we cherish, and some of those things are our strength. Yeah. This is the culture of our church. But, but subtly, um, you know, like what would that be then? What would that be? That's not, it's not necessarily speaking down to somebody, but what is that if you have an experience like that in a church? Yeah. What does that show about the culture? Yeah, I think, I think, and I mean, we're talking about the elephant in the room. I think there are <laughs> genuine levels of, of racism and prejudice in our churches where we actually don't talk about these things from the pulpit, you know, about 
mm. cultures and and how do we interact in a way that's showing God's love, not in a let's convert them kind of way, but in a how do we interact and engage. You know, we, we need to address those things from our pulpits. As, as leadership, we need to be talking about those things in our in our meetings. kind of not assuming that everybody in our churches, you know, have a really good heart as far as you know, uh, not being a racist or, or we kind of assume that because sure. they're you know, they look good on Sunday morning and they've got a nice haircut and they come right. in their family you know family minivan and everything's yeah. good. So hit those kind of things, Jeff. You're you're reaching out to a lot of young people, mm-hmm. not only uh, Asians and Africans. Yeah. Um, what about the youth uh, culture? Is are, are there behaviors within kind of the church as a whole that you would say, man, these are huge hindrances from your perspective? Yeah, um, let's, talk, let's talk about that just for a minute. In, in ministering to a wide variety of people, it's, it's been such a learning experience. Um, they share with me all kinds of different um, uh, experiences that they've had with Christians and um, and with pastors. And one of our guys is a he's a he's a, he's a pastor, and uh, but he's all tattooed up. When he goes and speaks at a church, he sits beside uh, and he would sit beside uh, an older woman. Uh, he shared a story where he sat beside older woman. The older woman took her purse and moved over a little bit. And he was like, wow. And then he was there to speak at the, <laughs> the church. So when he got up to speak, she was very, very sh- shocked. There's this presupposition that because he has tattoos, he might be a criminal or a crook. You know, that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not healthy. And then some of our, gu- some of our guys, they have, the, they have those, uh, I don't know, those piercings that are big. I don't know what they're called. Um, if you look at someone like that, you can't assume that they're not a dedicated Christian and love God. They might be a missionary. They might, like, you know, it's not, it's not just, you can't just have a presupposition based on how they look. And um, some of our guys have a different view than a classical Pentecostal view about alcohol. And so they will have a beer. Um, they, don't, they don't get drunk. They stay away from, from the sin of drunkenness. But if, if we judge them on their, their spirituality, just because we saw them have a beer, and we think that they're lower, that's not helpful. For some of them, they're having a beer with someone they're trying to reach, and they're and they're living as a missionary doing that. And they're not, in in my opinion, they're not sinning, uh, doing that. So there's all these these kind of presuppositions that are very very uh, toxic and and healthy. Fazl, you're you're uh, you're you have a um, a very strategic ministry in North America. Uh, to um, share information and live missionally. Um, as you begin to talk amongst the, the church in British Columbia, um, what are you discovering in terms of some of these behaviors? And as you become an advocate for ministry amongst Muslims, mm-hmm. uh, do you find yourself encouraged or disappointed? I think it's been a journey because we've been doing this for a while. Initially, there was a discouragement because the mindsets are so closed uh, and defined by media, like he even mentioned that earlier today. So I, I had to confront the fact that people had a mindset completely misunderstanding the Muslim world. They're, they're terrorists, they're evil, they're the enemy, and then a lot of our political church culture, particularly in America as well, and less in Canada, you know, stimulates they're the enemy. Let's you know. So most, most of our ministry has been Christians weeping and repenting for the wrong heart prejudices and racism that they've had against the Muslim people to then starting to pray and intercede out of love for them. And that has been the encouraging change. So the two most common things we get is emails or responses. We're weeping and repenting uh, for how we have seen these people, how we viewed them outside of God's plan. Mm. And the way we bring that to fruition is we bring about the God's plan for the Muslim people from the Bible. Now, that's already a shocking statement for most Christians. Like, how could the Bible have a plan for Muslims? It's very clear in there. They're, they come out of Ishmael. God blessed Ishmael. Ishmael was the first person to be named before birth in the Bible. Only four had been named that way by divinely granted appearance of an angel of the Lord. And Ishmael means God hears. So what we're saying is God named somebody because it's connected to their future, their destiny destiny, their assignment, God's made a promise, I'm going to hear the cry of Ishmael, I'm going to hear the cry of the Muslim people that's buried beneath the violence, that's buried beneath their culture, beneath all those things. And when you begin to open their eyes and they say, wow, Jesus has a plan. And even as I'm sharing this with you, Jesus had the same situation in the early church. Do you remember Ananias? Ananias and the church prejudged the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Remember, he was this, he was the terrorist of the early church. I mean, yeah. he was killing people. Yeah. He didn't. He thought he was superior. He thought all these things, and the church had written him off. 
And so, uh, you know, Jesus appears to Ananias and says, hey, you need to go to this guy, Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias, who's a faithful disciple, says, you know, pretty much perfect. Are you sure about this, Jesus? Do you know who this guy is? And Jesus says, no. I've called him. He's going to suffer for my name's sake. He's going to proclaim my name to the Jews, to the Gentiles. And I think that is an important word even forming in our midst here right now, that this is the Jesus whom we serve, that he loves and sees people differently than we do, whether it's, we, 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 we box them in, unfortunately. And that number one thing has got to change. And you're talking about leaders. We've got to be authentic. We've got to be transparent. We can't be a facade on the pulpit. We've got to be real where we are in everyday life. You know, like Jeff's kind of been hinting out to us here is authenticity and transparency. The more transparent I am, the more real I am uh, with people. I find that generates a genuine connection. But we got to get that heart of Jesus that he has. He sees people differently. And I think a good principle that I've been trying to adopt and put in our church is that we look at people as part of the inheritance in Christ. That God's already got a plan for them, regardless of their culture. We look at them as earthen vessels with heavenly treasure ready to be deposited. And so we're looking to see what's unique about them. We're looking to honor. That's another value that we have is a culture of honor. If you ever come around our ministry, it doesn't matter who you are, what culture you are, anything, you will be honored. People have developed the spirit of honor. That's one of our core values. And honor is effective to all cultures. Mm-hmm. You know, whether they're Japanese and they come in, you honor them with respect. You know, you, you bow, you show them a little bit of respect. Anytime we communicate that heart of honor, even when we're learning, we make those mistakes, people are more forgiving. People understand because they feel the love. They feel the honor. And it, it's not just feeling an emotion. It's spiritual. Okay, so let me, uh, let me, uh, let me sure. reverse this a bit. Okay. I was recently at Simon Fraser University in the Interface Chapel. Okay. I was there for the morning, slipped out for lunch, and came back, and there was about a hundred and there was about a hundred Muslims who had gathered for their prayer, uh, their early afternoon prayer, and I didn't know when I walked into the room, I was surprised, and to be honest, they were, I was intimidated, honestly, yeah. I, I did not feel like I belong. So in terms of honor, I did my best to stay. I said, Dave, stay in the stay in the room. Have staying power. But I didn't feel honored. No yeah. one talked to me. Yeah. Um, what? How do I work beyond that? Because if we're talking about honor, honor has to be ways. mutual, right? Right. Uh, no one said hi. So I'm okay. Let me just keep going here. I'm not complaining. I'm just reporting in the sense, yes. right? No one said hi to me, I, and because of that, I didn't feel welcome. There is obviously a cultural difference. Um, in some ways, a religious difference, maybe not cultural, but certainly a religious difference. I wanted to get out of there. Seriously. I wanted to leave. I was sweating. Why did you stay? Why did you stay? Well, I stayed momentarily because of this conversation and the belief that, as what you're saying, Jeff, they're just as much as Canadian as I am, and in some ways, out of honor. I stayed there to honor that and actually to learn Mm -hmm. and listen because I was really surprised. So, so, so one other thing that could have been done, obviously you may not have known to do this because you're wondering what's going on, is if you stayed there after they're finished, tell them what you did. Say, hey, I walked in the room, you guys are praying, and out of honor and respect for God and honor for you, I just kind of stood there, hope I didn't, is that okay? You're going to blow their minds, they're going to be like, oh, it's, of course it's okay. But the other side of the coin is, I agree with you, Dave. I mean, when we look at the Muslim world, it is a huge mission field, but yet a very difficult and challenging mission field, and many people would argue about whatever field they come from. But... The onus is on us. We are the Christ followers. We set the example. We sow the seed, and we reap the harvest. When we sow honor, the Bible says we'll reap honor. We sow love, we're going to reap love. And so the more we do it, we're supposed to love our enemies. So I think even now, in a sense, in answering you, I believe I'm challenging our our mindset here in the church, and I think that's what you guys intended. You wanted to have some challenge. Well, let's provoke the church a little bit and say, wait a minute, the onus rests on us. We are to release that honor. We are to release that love. And when we're mistreated, we're the ones to forgive first because that's the Jesus we serve and that's where our life kind of you know exudes yeah. out of it's it's knowing that you know who he who is within us really has nothing you know there's there's nothing that can compare to that and so you know for for me to go to a temple and to go prayerfully go and, and to be at, at a temple is to know that god you you're within me and and there's all kinds of things that could happen here but it has nothing it has nothing in comparison to to your power and your uh your godliness you know you are god you are the god you know there there is no other uh, if I could just quickly comment, in that room, one other thing you could do or somebody else, because you didn't go looking for that, you just happened to run I into did, an interfaith yeah. chapel. 
Well, one of the things is greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. First thing you could do is, Father, while these people are praying, yeah. I pray that they begin to have dreams and visions and encounter your presence in their mm -hmm. prayer time right now. Yeah, I amen. thank you for that. I ask you for that. Amen. And I'm your representative yeah. in this room, and I request that right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. So let's change our thinking. Let's let's become a church that is not afraid. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, love mobilizes, fear paralyzes. You know, and that's the thing. Yeah. If you truly love, we're going to be pushed into action. And you are acting out of love. That's why you stayed. Yeah. Because you were already acting out of love, you already were acting out of honor, but you just didn't know what to do. Yeah. So, you know, you already took the first step, so to speak, for us in that sense for many people watching or, or many leaders or pastors watching. You know what? It's okay. What about the God we serve? What about praying and yeah. say, God, it's, it's not a huge <clears throat> prayer. Don't call the intercessors, call all the TV ministries. Just get there and say, God, I ask for your presence to Amen. be revealed to them right you know, now. I, I think that is so huge. I mean, whether we're talking about reaching Muslims, whether we're talking about being in the middle of a, a rock concert and, and, and reaching young people, you know, as they're just jumping around, they got crazy hair. Jesus, just make yourself real, you know, somehow uh, intervene in their lives. And, uh, you know, I just started uh, reading the book that you produced recently and just some of the amazing stories, uh, hearing how God has just intervened right in the middle of people's lives. Let's believe that for, uh, for Sikhs, for Asians, for young people, for Muslims, for all kinds of um, cultures that we that we minister to, uh, rural cultures, all kinds of cultures all over BC. We have about 30 seconds, to, but a minute left. And um, we're um, believing that the Spirit of God has energized this conversation, hey? Eh? Really. Yeah. Um, so what would be your closing, or, or what have you heard in the, as the, you know, the themes that have run through this conversation today? We've talked about sensitivity, we've talked about love, fear paralyzing, be culturally sensitive. So as, as you have sat here and engaged in this conversation, what would what would you say the Spirit is saying to the church in British Columbia and Yukon? As 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 you serve as as pastors in this in, in these communities and within this province, in a just in a twenty seconds, what, what is the spirit saying, do you believe today? Uh, to us. For me, I think the Spirit is saying, keep moving on, keep moving forward. I want, I want to highlight that we have a Pakistani-Canadian district superintendent. Like, I don't know if we've ever had that in the history of this district. That's, that's, that's a huge step. Also, the, with the church plants, um, the host culture church plants have always been separate from the ethnic church plants. And then over this past year, they've started to meet together. These are huge things. Like, from from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. Funding has only, has mainly gone to host culture church plants, and uh, so it's this stuff is built with into the structures. It's not just at the church level. So, but we're we're, we're moving in the right direction. Let's keep moving on. I'd say step out of the box. Let's be real. And understand that God is cooperating with us. Amen. There is a He's with us. He, he He says, "I'll send you," but that means I go with you. Yeah, right on. Yeah, and I think I, I would just close by saying, you know, I, I think that we need to realize and teach our people and our churches that the mission field is right here. We hear that all the time. The mission field is here, but honestly, the mission field is here, and, and encourage our people to naturally uh, integrate into the, the communities that they're part of, and and intentionally go and engage with people and learn and, and explore, use that internet and try to find out stuff about what people believe in their faith and then integrate and, and intentionally do that. Um, it's such a huge opportunity. Can I mention one more thing? In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about uh, being at the throne, separating the lambs and the sheep, feeding the hung, uh, giving drink to the thirsty, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. He also talks about welcoming the stranger, someone who's different than you. And um, we, we often think about feeding the hungry and, you know, and things like that, visiting people in prison or the sick in hospitals, but welcoming the stranger is welcoming Christ. Awesome. I uh, wonder if we could just pray real quickly and, uh, before we go. Um, and, uh, but before we do go, we will uh, just want to announce that our next webinar will be recorded at the Adore Conference in Victoria. Dave and I will be over there. We're going to be talking to a panel of, of some young adults, some 20-somethings, and kind of springboarding off of this discussion, which is reaching into different cultures. Uh, obviously, the 20-somethings, the young adults, there's never been a generation alive on earth where there's been so much change and, and so much cultural change and, and technology and, uh, and the church is changing, so many things. So I can't wait for that conversation. And then the next day on the Monday, we're inviting pastors and leaders. There's information we're going to be sending out really soon to stay as well after that. But I wonder if we just pray uh, before we go. Uh, Pastor Fazl prays for us. That would be awesome. As 
as uh, you've joined our uh, district webinar, and we're so appreciative of it, and Jazz and Jeff, but, but specifically your involvement today. You've blessed our district, and, and, and as Ben was saying, what a great way to end. If you would pray for our churches, that we would cooperate and we would be strategic. And uh, we, what a great way to end our conversation today. The, the so we would consider, so appreciate consider it. Consider it an honor. Father, I just thank you for this district and this and this movement and this ministry here. Father, I just pray your presence will begin to increase upon the, the leaders, the ministers, thank and the Lord. churches. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come in and invade these churches. We thank you for divine wisdom and revelation and strategy to come upon people, that they begin to recognize the grace that you placed upon them, the anointing, the uniqueness, the, the specificity of the calling, that they begin to get encouraged with what you've placed in them, that they begin to recognize every good thing that you've placed in them in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that your presence, I keep sensing your presence, and even here, uh, uh, Jeff here, I really sense there's going to be an increase of God's presence. Yes, and I love your heart here. And God just wants you to know that he's going to honor you in this season. That you're going to begin to see greater honor come into the house. And you're going to see his presence reach out to those strangers. Because every stranger loves the presence of God. And so there's such a, such a grace being released upon you. And I also want to challenge you. The Spirit of God is going to cause you guys to think differently about, the, about things about the end times. To begin to, to change your, some of your root thinking. And begin to realize it was about Jesus. It was about the Spirit of God. It was about the revelation of God's word. And God is saying, I'm willing to back the moving of my spirit. I'm willing to back my, my, my intentions. There are corporate strategies and God is even going to release a corporate understanding and revelation to, to the Pentecostal assemblies of Canada that how he's not just a personal God, but also he's a corporate God Amen. and he's got corporate strategies yeah. and he uniquely uses and assigns and anoints people to carry out those assignments. And God is also sovereign in that when you have an assignment, God's sovereign hand will rest upon you and be rest assured if you walk in the sovereign an assignment of God. His hand will rest upon you and his hand will deal with your opposition and deal with the enemies that would like to corporately oppose God's purpose in your life. So be mindful of his presence, be mindful of his person, but also be mindful of his purpose corporately that's operating through you. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say amen. 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 Thanks for being a part of our webinar today. Uh, this has been recorded and it will be uploaded a little bit later on today. So thanks for being a part of it. And uh, pass on the links so that others can uh, learn with us. Thanks, friends, for Thanks being a part again. of a good day. It was day. an honor. Thank awesome. you. All right. Thank you, guys. That was fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your prayers, too. Yeah. Nice meeting you guys. What a great, what a great yeah. discussion. Yeah, it was fun. I've learned so much. Yeah.